Hello, I'm Vitotas and I will present you our work titled How do programmers use unsafe Rust? First, let's have a look into what is unsafe Rust. Rust is a programming language that can be viewed as composed of two sub-languages, Safe Rust and Unsafe Rust. Safe Rust is the default and you can temporarily switch to Unsafe Rust by using the Unsafe keyboard. Both sub-languages have to uphold the invariance of the Rust type system, such as that the references are never dangling. These type invariants imply the important safety properties of the Rust language, such as memory safety, arithmetic safety, and data race freedom. The core difference between the sublanguages is that in the safe Rust, the invariants are automatically enforced by the compiler, but at the same time, safe Rust is more restrictive to be efficiently checkable. In the Unsafe Rust, the programmer is responsible for preserving the invariance, but she also has access to the lower level operations that cannot be checked by the compiler. Why do we need the additional power of Unsafe Rust? Let's have a look at an example. Imagine you want to build an X-ray machine. Most of it can be built from regular components like plastic pieces and cables. Similarly, most of its software, such as a user interface, can be written in a memory-safe, high-level language such as Java or Python. However, building the core component, the X-Ray generator, requires not only more knowledge and care, but also using different techniques. Similarly, part of the software that accesses the hardware cannot be expressed in a high-level language such as Java. Therefore, programmers in such cases typically resort to C or other low-level languages. On the other hand, since Unsafe Rust allows using low-level operations, the entire system could be implemented completely in Rust. Therefore, Unsafe Rust is similar to radioactive materials. Dangerous, because the compiler does not help the programmer, but in some cases, unavoidable. When working with radioactive materials, one of the key questions is, how do you make sure that they do not leak? In Rust, this is ensured by encapsulating unsafe Rust in a safe abstraction. The main challenge is ensuring safety not only when the component is used as intended, but also when it is completely misused. In the rest of this presentation, we will focus on the question, how do the programmers use unsafe Rust? In our paper, we have also explored why do the programmers use unsafe Rust. One example we already saw, using unsafe for directly accessing hardware. Other examples include manually manipulating memory and avoiding safety checks to speed up code. You can find more examples and detailed analysis in our paper. But now let's go back to the how. After reviewing many official and unofficial sources on using unsafe Rust, we found that most of them agree on the following three principles that should help limit the dangers of unsafe code. Unsafe code should be used sparingly in order to benefit the guarantees inherently provided by safe Rust. Unsafe code blocks should be straightforward and self-contained to minimize the amount of code that developers have to vouch for, for example, through manual reviews. Unsafe code should be well encapsulated behind safe abstractions. For example, libraries that use unsafe Rust internally should not expose public unsafe functions. 
We call the claim that unsafe code is used according to these three principles, the Rust hypothesis. Our core research question was, does the Rust hypothesis hold? To answer it, we looked into four research questions that should give insights where programmers follow each of these principles. We decided to investigate these questions by doing an automatic analysis of all packages published on the official Rust package registry called Crates.io. For this, we have built Crates, a framework that allows running queries on all compilable crates from the registry. Crates is composed from multiple components. Extractor, that uses the Rust-wide infrastructure to run a modified version of a compiler on all packages, a database, a data log-like query engine based on Datafrog, and Jupyter Notebooks for the final analysis. In addition to the automatic analysis, we also sometimes performed manual inspection to complement the automatically collected results. When we did our analysis, Crates.io had more than 34,000 packages in it. We have successfully compiled and analyzed almost 29,000, which is 84%. Each package could contain one or more crates. A crate is a unit of compilation in Rust. Our final dataset contains almost 32,000 crates. Let's now have a look at our four research questions one by one. The first principle claimed that unsafe code should be used sparingly. Therefore, our first question is, how often does unsafe code appear explicitly in Rust crates? In our dataset, we found that almost a quarter of crates contain at least one use case of some unsafe feature, such as an unsafe block, an unsafe function, or an unsafe trait. Let's narrow our view to the 21% of crates that contain unsafe statements. On the x-axis, we have the proportion of unsafe statements. On the y-axis, a cumulative percentage of crates. We can see that around a quarter of crates has a proportion of unsafe statements of at least 20%. With these numbers, we cannot claim that the developers use unsafe code sparingly. The first question we looked into was Boolean. Either a particular crate uses unsafe or not. Since the second principle claims that unsafe blocks should be straightforward, a natural follow-up question is, what is the size of unsafe blocks that programmers write? We chose to measure the size of unsafe blocks in terms of statements used in the intermediate compiler representation called MIR. We chose this metric because it is less dependent on the programming style. Let's on x-axis put the unsafe block size in MIR statements. It is capped at 100 to improve readability. Then we plot the cumulative distribution of unsafe block sizes. We can see that three quarters of all unsafe blocks have at most 21 statements. For comparison, the shown unsafe block has 12 statements, which is more than the median of 10. So, the size of unsafe blocks is typically small. Assuming that the size is a good proxy for complexity, we conclude that most developers keep the unsafe blocks simple. This supports the second principle of the Rust hypothesis. The second principle also requires the unsafe blocks to be self-contained. Therefore, we also looked at the following research question. 
is the behavior of unsafe code dependent only on code in its own crate? To answer this question, we looked at function calls made in unsafe blocks. We found that 4% are calling closures and function pointers. 18% of calls are calls of trade methods such as get on the trade index. We manually checked 100 randomly selected calls and found that in 82 cases the call can be determined statically. Therefore, these calls do not add substantially to the complexity of the unsafe block. The remaining 78% are standard function calls such as foo or five. If you look deeper into them, we can see that 52% of these calls target functions from a standard library, 26% target functions from the same crate, 15% the crates that provide raw C bindings, and only 7% of standard calls target functions defined in our crates. To sum up, it seems that most unsafe blocks are self-contained. The third principle claimed that unsafe code should be hidden behind the safe abstractions. Therefore, the last question we looked into is, is unsafe code typically shielded from clients through safe abstractions? To evaluate this question, we looked at the specified visibility of unsafe functions. We expected that if Rust programmers adhere to the third principle, the majority of unsafe functions will be hidden within the safe abstraction by making them private. We found that 11.7% of functions are declared as private, while 0.3% are visible only from within the same crate. Surprisingly, we found that even 88% were declared as public. Since that high number of public functions directly contradicts the third principle, we looked into proportion of unsafe functions declared as public. We found that most crates ever have all the unsafe functions as private or as public, and that there is only a few crates in between. We checked the crates that have many public unsafe functions and found that most of them provide raw bindings either for accessing hardware or for accessing libraries written in other languages. Therefore, even though it is hard to make definite conclusions, it seems that Rust programmers at least attempt to not expose unsafe functions to their clients. To summarize, we found that rather many crates use unsafe code, but most unsafe blocks are simple and self-contained. And most unsafe functions are either private or raw bindings that are not intended to be private. Therefore, we cannot claim that the Rust programmers completely adhere to the principles that guide the use of unsafe. However, we hope that our work will help the community to find the missing safe abstractions and tools that prevent the dangers of unsafe Rust. More specifically, you can find the thorough analysis of why programmers use unsafe code in our paper. Also, our infrastructure is open source and is available on GitHub. While we designed it for analysis of unsafe code, it can also be used for checking prevalence of our language features and potentially even be converted to a linter.